Friendy, welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, just a reminder that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available on the York County History Center YouTube channel. Um, just a couple announcements from the History Center before I turn it over to the Civil War Roundtable. Uh, the York County History Center Museums and Library will be closing on December 4th to prepare for our big move uh, to our new building. Uh, look for us to open the new History Center at the steam plant in June of 2024. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about that. And there's lots more information on our website. We will continue to hold programs in this room and online until the new building is open. Upcoming events on November 18th, this weekend is our Articles of Confederation Day at the Colonial Courthouse. It's always a fun day of festivities and um, original documents to see. Our, on December 3rd is our member holiday party if you're a History Center member or wannabe. It's a lovely time. On December 7th, we are partnering on a storytellers program at Windridge Farms. And on December 13th, we'll have our writers round table. The speaker is Don Linewall, speaking about the Ramsey Theater in Stewartstown. So for more information on our programs and to register, please visit yorkhistorycenter.org. Thank you very much and hope you have a nice evening. There's, Scott's gonna join you right now. Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending, uh, those who are in person and those who are watching online. Uh, this is our last meeting of 2023. We do take off December for the holiday season. So thank you for all those who have attended throughout the year and are here tonight. Uh, as Nicole said, we will continue to have programs here during the first part of the year until we move to uh, the new facility. But uh, January and February, as we have done in the past, there are going to be online only programs to avoid any weather issues that tend to happen in those months. So the next two month, two programs will be online only. And we do have some, uh, starting to get some good speakers lined up for next year. I'm definitely looking forward to hearing and seeing the, some of their programs. And we're gonna be starting off on January 17th. And we're gonna have, again, an online only meeting and hear a pre presentation by Janet Prune, wrote this book, The Word Outside My Window, the Civil War Diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham, and uh, it's a remarkable account of the collapse of the Old South. Uh, Gresham was born in 1847 to an affluent safe slaveholding family in Macon, Georgia, and he had a, a, a horrific leg injury when he was 12 year old, and so he was uh, he was an invalid the whole time. He, he basically watched the war as it was happening outside his window, as the title says. Um, he watched as he started writing his diary in 1860, as a secession crisis was happening, as he watched the, the nation fall apart. And his life ended in 1865. The Library of Congress uh, has this, his seven volume diary as one of its premier manuscripts. And he read books, devoured newspapers, magazines. He debated important social and military issues with his parents and others. And he wrote almost daily for five years, putting pen to paper with a vim and tongue in cheek vigor, as, as uh, Dan has told us, that impresses even today. His practical, philosophical, and occasionally twain like jovial observations cover politics, secession movement, slavery, and the long and increasingly destructive war, and what daily life was like at the center of a socially prominent wealthy family the important Confederate man manufacturing center of Macon. Again, the, the award-winning book here, The War Outside My Window, is edited and annot annotated by Janet Prune, and it captures the spirit of, and the character of the young, white, non-combatant teenager witnessing the demise of his world, even as his own body slowly failed him. Um, she says that just as Anne Frank has come down to us as the adolescent voice of World War II, Leroy will... 
uh, now be remembered as a young voice of the Civil War South. Janet holds a bachelor's degree in political science, modern European history, Russian language and area studies, and a master's in international studies. She taught international baccalaureate history for two decades in the Fairfax County public school system. She's originally from Chicago. She has lived in several places, including Dayton, Ohio, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Wiesbaden, Germany, before eventually ending up in Northern Virginia suburbs. And she's also the author of a companion book, a, a curriculum guide based on this book that she'll be talking about next month, uh, not next, in January, sorry. Tonight, we're gonna welcome back Brad and Godfrey as they do part two of the presentation they did last year about Lincoln Comes to Gettysburg. Last year, they talked about the creation of the cemetery, and tonight they're gonna to talk about the dedication of the cemetery and uh, about Lincoln and his visit here. I'm gonna answer some interesting questions that are out there. Um, still people debate, I guess, of what happened, what did Lincoln do when he was here? Um, what was the crowd reaction? Those are things that people are interested in, still interested in, and we hope to find out a lot about tonight. Uh, Brad Gottfried earned his uh, PhD in zoology, and he served as a college educator for 40 years, and he was president of two different colleges and retired in 2017. He's written 18 books on the Civil War, probably more by now, it's, it's a growing list, and he's a Gettysburg Town Guide and Antietam Licensed Battlefield Guide. Linda Gottfried earned a BFA and served as a graphic designer, develop officer at several colleges and nonprofits before retiring in 2015. Now she spends time as a sculptor and enjoying retirement and has several won awards on several of her pieces. So now uh, let's welcome the Godfrey's back here as they tell us about Lincoln's visit to Gettysburg. Thank you, it's, it's great to be back. How do you say no to Kathy when she invites you? Uh, so as, uh, how many of you were able to come last year and heard about the dedication? of this, of not the dedication, but the formation of the cemetery. I wish I could have gotten it all into one presentation. It just, there's just too much. And as Kathy was mentioning, she actually read it cover to cover. I appreciate that in the book. Um, there's a lot in there. And so tonight, what I'm going to be doing, and Linda's going to be sitting there critiquing me and telling me what I've forgotten to bring up. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Lincoln's visit and the dedication actual ceremony. And really it's more about the mysteries than anything else because we all expect that we all know exactly what happened, right? We know everything about Lincoln, right? I mean, how many thousands of books have been written about Abraham Lincoln? So you would expect everything is known, right? Well, and we're gonna see all the mysteries relating to his visit. Now, um, I should have told you to bring a pillow because this goes a little long and I won't be upset if we go, I'm not talking two hours, don't worry, <laughs> but it might be over 50 minutes. Um, so if you feel like, you know, it's bedtime and you have to leave, I certainly understand. Okay, enough of me babbling, let's go on with it. The other error. Is it the other one? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So there's the book. Uh, all right. So the past talk, basically, it was we talked about the need for the National Cemetery. You probably remember. Uh, one thing that's interesting is if you look at the context of the cemetery, what, what cemetery, National Cemetery, do we usually think of when we think about the National Cemetery? Our National Cemetery. Arlington. Arlington. And when was Arlington actually formed? Anybody? 1864, see you're after this. Now this was not the first national cemetery. There are other national cemeteries. Um, Congress had passed some laws that said, we're gonna be doing this. The problem was none of them had ever been, had a formal dedication ceremony like this one's going to have. This ceremony is unique as you may recall, 
because the federal government doesn't spend a dime on it. It's called a national cemetery because of all the young men from at least 18 states that gave their lives the last full measure. The state of Pennsylvania is going to buy the land and all of the states that lost young men are going to contribute um, to cover the cost of not only burying the dead, but also the the, uh, the monument that a lot went up, et cetera. Okay, so let's go beyond that. Let's talk about the ceremony. Yeah. So the whole thing is, uh, you might recall, here's David Wills. He's trying to figure out what should be in this ceremony. And he doesn't have any models because no national cemetery has been dedicated up to this point. And so, as you may recall, he's going to look at some munici municipal uh, cemeteries. And he realizes that there are three major components. Remember the three from last year? Number one, the most important is the oration. And the oration, if it's going to be special, and, and David Wills, who's the backbone behind all of this, he wants it to be special. He wants this to be the event of the century. He wants thousands of thousands of people to come to Gettysburg. And this guy's going to bring them in. This is Edward Everett, the who's who of orators. He has done just about everything. When you think about his background, he was senator from Massachusetts. He was president of Harvard University, secretary of state for a while. He was ambassador to England. I mean, the list goes on and on. And he's a fantastic orator and everybody wants him, but he's become very selective. And he is going to be invited and to the surprise and glee of the people who are, this is the, all the commissioners uh, representing each state that lost young men during the battle. He accepts, but on one condition, actually there's two conditions we'll talk about, but one condition mainly, when did they want to do it? Mid-October. What's it like in October in, in York, in Gettysburg? It's nice, right? Does it snow? No, and it certainly does, it doesn't freeze. He can't do it. He says, yeah, I'd love to do it, but I'm booked up solid into November. I can do it in the middle of November, but no sooner. So imagine you're on the committee and you have to decide, do we do it when we know the weather's gonna be good or do we cross our fingers, hope the weather's gonna be okay, but we get this guy. And you know what they decided, we're going to get this guy. And this guy is going to give a two-hour oration, which is not unusual. That was typical back then. You know, people complain about it now. They, they think it was funny. Back then, uh, it was the thing you needed to expect. He also decides and finds out that there has to be music. You might remember, I believe I touched on this last year, that you want Lincoln. You just don't want the oration, you want Lincoln, you want the big guy. And how are you going to get him? Well, we're going to see a number of ways that they're going to get this guy. One way is you get his favorite band. His favorite band is the Marine Band. And they will actually be on the train with Lincoln. And every time that train stops, they'll hop off onto the platform. They're going to play their little hearts out. As that train starts moving down the track, they jump back on. Hopefully they didn't drop anybody off. So they get the Marine Band, okay. And over to the left, the Adolph Birchfield Band. I'll bet you've never heard of this band, right? I never did. This is Governor Curtin's favorite band out of Philadelphia. So, you know, the governor, he, he, he's a strong proponent of this cemetery. He got the legislature to buy the land. He's been behind it from day one. You wanna do something nice for him, you bring in his favorite band. And there has to be prayers, of course. It's a sacred event. And the guy on the left, T.H. Th. Stockton, is well known. He is the chaplain of the U.S. House of Representatives. Everybody knows him. He's a natural. He's going to give the invocation. The guy on the right is well known in Gettysburg, Henry Balder. He's the president of Pennsylvania College, now Gettysburg College. He's going to give the benediction. And it's a nod to those civilians and citizens of Gettysburg who have sacrificed so much. You're going to bring one of their own to be part of the ceremony. 
There's also going to be the Maryland um, Glee Club will come. They will chant an ode, a poem. We don't have odes today, but it, it'll be chanting a poem that was uh, created just for this event. It's a big deal. Well, the controversy, and do you remember the con? I think I may have touched on it last year. You probably don't remember, do you? Well, let's talk about the controversy. The controversy is not that Wills is going to be everybody on the committee. There are 18 uh, states involved. There are 18 commissioners, representatives, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and they will invite, they all agree, the president should be invited, no question about it. David Wills, as I'll show you a couple letters from him, will invite the president on the 2nd of November to come and be part of this sacred ceremony. And he has a second letter we're gonna see, also on the second. By the way, if you decide to come, you can spend the night in my house. What a deal. Doesn't have to stay at a motel. and doesn't have to worry about someone paying, right, Scott, for the, for the, uh, the night. Nobody, nobody thinks he's coming. And the big surprise is, he says, yeah, I think I will come. I'm not certain now. I'm busy. I know it's tough to get to Gettysburg, but I think I'm coming. Well, all hell breaks loose at that point. Especially when this commissioner from Illinois, Mark Kerr, pipes up, let him speak. Let him talk. Now, that may sound odd to you, because, of course, if you invite the president, of course, you're going to want him to speak, right? Well, all hell broke loose of that. Because there are many members of that committee who said, absolutely not. He can't talk. He can sit in the front row. He can look pretty. He can look presidential. But he can't open his mouth. Can you imagine that? And the rationale, you know, you might say, well, why? And there are the others said, well, why? One... This thing's going to go long, very, very long between the oration, the person. It's going to go forever. Do we really want him giving a long speech? No, we don't want him giving a speech. Forget it. Number two, the explanation was he's never done this before. Well, no one's really done it before. He's never done it before. He won't know what to say or what to do. And our, our bad luck will be if he starts telling his his very folksy tales, you know, he always tells these stories. And you probably know that some of them were occasionally off color. And imagine he's up there, sacred, sacred ceremonies telling jokes. <laughs> um, and so they did not want him to talk. Well, who were these men? No women. Who, who were these men? who did not want him to talk. These were the Democrats. These were representatives from, for instance, New York State, who did not, what's the following year? Election year. Lincoln's coming up for re-election, 1864. Do you want to give him a national platform if you're a Democrat? No, you don't want him to talk at all. The Republicans, on the other hand, let him speak. If he wants to go two hours, let him go two hours. He's our president. And they're going to go back and forth for quite a while. And finally, they will come up with a compromise that will be written to, uh, to the president by David Wills on the 14th, another letter to the president, that again, we really want you to come. We want you to be part of the ceremony. We want you to say a few appropriate remarks. Now, it's, we're going to see it's not easy to get to Gettysburg. You're the president. You've been elected fairly by the people. You didn't get the majority, but you're president. If I get that, you know what? I'm going to be insulted. They're telling me that I can come, but I can only say a few appropriate remarks. Wouldn't you feel that way? I would. And he, to his credit, took it. And actually, that's why his, his remarks were so short. Because he took it to heart. I would have gone as long as I wanted. The heck with them. <laughs> there are the two letters. The one on the left is the invitation. This is the Library of Congress. The one on the left is uh, the invitation to Lincoln. The one on the right is the invitation to stay at the, uh, David Will's house. Beautiful house on the square. 
So I think we talked a little bit about this last time. Um, there was, there is, even when he said, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm coming. They weren't certain. He didn't commit a hundred percent. He says, I think I'm going to come. It is very, very difficult to leave Washington. And, and we forget this, you know, we're spoiled with our current presidents. They're never in the white house. It seems they're always on the road. They got air force one. They've got Marine one. They've got, they got all, they got cars, et cetera. Back then it was very, very difficult to leave Washington. Uh, Lincoln is only going to, I believe, only leave Washington twice up to this point. One is uh, actually, I don't have it on here, but when uh, during the Peninsula campaign, when McClellan is at the gates of Richmond, he will hop on a boat and he'll sail down the Potomac River into the Chesapeake Bay and he'll visit McClellan and actually help him to capture Norfolk. That's easy though, he hopped on a boat. He will also visit the Antietam battlefield, which is not that far away. So um, it's tough. It's tough to get outside of Washington. And Lincoln, who is perpetually, mm, I don't want to say fighting with Mary Todd, they have their issues. And she's not happy. And many professional um whether it's spouses, it doesn't have to be the wife, it could be the husband, when the, the spouse is successful and very, very busy and they never see, Mary, Wilson, Mary Todd never sees Lincoln. He's busy. He's working constantly in his office. And he knows that she's not happy with him. And she says, he says to her, let's make this a family outing. Let's you and me and Tad, little boy Tad, about seven years old, Let's go to uh, watch the Re Gettysburg together as a family. Let's make it a family outing. And she says, yeah, that sounds great. Perfect. And then we have a problem. And that is one of his children becomes very, very ill on the 17th. Now remember, when is the dedication? On the 19th, right? On the 17th, one of his children gets very ill. How many children has he, I don't want to say he's or a sire, it sounds like a bull, but how many children does he have? Did he, did he, how many sons did he have? He had four. And we know that, well, you know Robert, there's Robert over there. This is Edward. Edward is, uh, he's gone. He's going to die about, I think it was 1850. They think he died of cancer before the age of four. Little guy. And then imagine you're Lincoln, and there's Tad, Mary, etc. Up on the wall is Willie. Willie died the year before, typhoid fever. So you've lost two sons, and your baby, Tad, could be on his deathbed with a form of smallpox. Smallpox will kill you, but a form of smallpox. It's not the most virulent form. It's called variola. But it could still kill him. Would you go? Would you, if you've lost two sons, would you leave his bedside? I don't know if I could have, but Lincoln is going to do it. Mary is furious. She cannot believe that he would even consider it. Well, we don't know. By the way, this is really termed the mysteries of Lincoln's visit. So this is one of her first mysteries. We don't know exactly when he actually decided he would come. Governor Curtin, they, our governor, great wartime governor, uh, is very close to Lincoln. And he will visit Lincoln in the executive mansion on the 14th. And probably one of the things he mentioned was the possibility of him coming to Gettysburg and be part of the dedication ceremony. And Lincoln had to be nice to this guy because this is the largest Republican state in the Union. So I'm sure he put a little pressure on Lincoln. Uh, we think he may have decided as early as the 15th. And planning begins on the 16th, but then there's 10. And then it sort of puts a, a brick right into the works at this point. They all know that man, right? Who is that? Edwin Stanton. 
Has anyone ever seen a photograph of Edwin Stan smiling? <laughs> I don't think so. This man, I don't think this man ever cracked a smile in his entire life. Secretary of War, he has no intention of coming to Gettysburg, but he will say to President Lincoln, listen, I will map out your itinerary for you. And I'm not coming. And Lincoln says, that's fine. And he says, you know, I, you've got a sick child. You have a, a workload that will kill a bear. I know that you can't afford to have a whole lot of time away from the executive mansion. How about if I plan an itinerary where I get you on the train the morning of the dedication, the 19th? You get there, you participate, you say a few uh, appropriate remarks, you get back on the train, you've only lost a few hours. What do you think? What does Lincoln say to him? Are you nuts? <laughs> because these trains are totally unreliable. They're always breaking down. And oftentimes you have cows that'll wander onto the tracks and derail the locomotive with the cars. And that's going to delay him. He said, the worst thing that can happen, Lincoln says, is I get there late. I get there. Yeah, I get there on the 19th if I leave in the morning, but I get there after the ceremony is over. Why bother? I, if I'm going, I'm going the day before. And that's what the decision is. You will leave the day before, which is going to make Mary even more upset. If he had left that morning, I don't think she would have felt as, as angry as she was. Um, this is showing you the, the how difficult it was. Um, it wasn't one lane or one train or one line to go from Washington to Gettysburg. There's actually three. He has to go, to, uh, first he has to go to the train uh, depot in Washington, hop on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. It'll go to Baltimore. By the way, is he happy about going to Baltimore? He, I don't think he's been to Baltimore since he was going for his inauguration when he was looked like he might have been assassinated. He does not want to go to Baltimore, but he goes. And the locomotive will be detached in Baltimore. The, the, the cars will be dragged across Baltimore to another train station. The uh, new locomotive along the Northern Central Railroad will be hooked up. And off he goes to Pennsylvania, to Hanover Junction to pick up, and again, the same process, which apparently this line was horrible. Everybody said it was horrible. It was slow. It was not well maintained. It was small, et cetera. But it's going to take him quite a while because of that. And as you'll see, he is not, well, he's not alone. Could you imagine Lincoln being on a train all by him? Is Lincoln an introvert? Lincoln is not an introvert. He's got all his buddies on that train and he's having a good old time, cracking jokes, telling stories, listening to stories, et cetera. The guy on the right is uh, John Carrick. He's the president of the B&O Railroad, very, very wealthy. He's got a very beautiful decked out car. That's his own personal car. He's gonna lend that to Lincoln. And that car will be used by Lincoln during the, the journey. I don't know. I don't think that Garrett actually was part of the entourage. Um, so he's gonna he's gonna travel in style. The guy on the left, I don't know if I mentioned this last year. That's that's General Brigadier General James Fry. You'll never find him on a battlefield, you'll never find him in charge of troops. He's a bureaucrat general, there's nothing wrong with that. They need plenty of those. He has the unenviable task of getting Lincoln, extracting Lincoln from the executive mansion in the White House onto the carriage and to the train station. And Lincoln doesn't want to go. Lincoln is busy. He's very, very busy. And he is getting more and more frustrated. He keeps asking Lincoln to stop what you're doing. Please, Mr. President, come on. You got it. The train's going to leave. You got to get on that train. And uh, the president says, I'm busy. I've got a few more things I need to do. And he's starting to pace back and forth in front of the office. And Lincoln finally gets exasperated with this guy. You can imagine that. And he says, come here, sit on that, sit over there, he says. He says, I'm gonna tell you a story. <laughs> he 
He says, there was once a man on his way to the gallows. His hands are bound and his feet are bound. They're going to kill him. I know what he did, probably murdered someone. And all these townspeople are running past full speed. And he yells out to them, what's your hurry? They're not going to start without me. To tell Fry that that train isn't going anywhere without the president. Eventually, the president does relent. Somewhere about noon, uh, 12 30, uh, he will get to the train. It will leave the station and it will begin its journey to Baltimore. Um, now, I believe, Scott, I think I got this photograph from one of your uh, articles or blogs or whatever. Um, but here we have some photos of Hanover Junction. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, crap. Yeah, I think this is where I had it on my on my computer. Okay, it's okay. Well, Scott will tell you that there is a couple photographs of someone from a distance looks just like Lincoln standing right at the station. Right, Scott? And then if you if you go a little closer, there's a close-up. Uh, it's not Lincoln, was it? Didn't look like Lincoln. Some people wanted to look like Lincoln, but I don't think the guy had a beard, for instance. He was, he was tall, had a top hat, et cetera. Um, maybe that'll be part three. I'll tell you about that. Anyway, he's going to get to Gettysburg, finally. Uh, some say 6 o'clock in the evening. Some say 6.30. He doesn't matter. And he will begin walking up Carlisle Street. Have you all been to the train station? Really neat place. Now, uh, they made it into a virtual reality studio. So it used to be you could go in and you could see where the two sides of the waiting room were subdivided into men and women. You could see the spittoons. You could see the, the place on the, on the floor where the wall was. And now all you get are goggles. And you can be Basil Biggs or um, or, a, or a, a nurse or a, or I guess a musician, drummer, boy, I can't remember. But anyway. anyway, he's going to walk up. There are, again, we're not certain how many people are actually there. Some said 10,000. A commonly accepted figure is 15,000. Some actually said 50,000 people came to that ceremony. 50,000. I find that hard to believe personally. So I'm saying. Now, Lincoln is basically going to come alone when it comes to his cabinet. Most of his cabinet, you would think the cabinet is going to come to support him, wouldn't you? I would think so. But that's not the case. Only three of his cabinet members will come. The guy on the right has become a good friend, even though they were, out, they were adversaries to become to get the nomination for president. But William Seward, Secretary of State, has become a very close friend and confidant of the president. So he's coming. Over on the left, how many of you have heard of John Usher? Not too many. He's the uh, Secretary of the Interior. He comes. And you probably have all heard of the Blair family. Montgomery Blair is the Postmaster General. Of course, he's going to be. And they'll be on the train with him. And these are, I don't know, can Zoom see the, can Zoom see the, the screen? Yes. Okay. So I don't have to read this, right? <laughs> this is simply saying it was crowded. It was very, very crowded there. Okay. One of the heroes is not David Wills, although David Wills really should get an immense amount of credit for his work in getting this national cemetery created. There's no question about that. He's going to be actively engaged in developing the ceremony, but it's his wife who needs to get a lot of kudos because here she is, Catherine Smyzer Wills. I think she comes from York, from her family, if I'm not mistaken. Comes from a very wealthy family from York. She's pregnant. She's eight months. She has three children. She's eight months pregnant. And imagine this good for nothing over on the right comes home one day and says, oh, by the way, Catherine, the president is coming for dinner. 
and about 35 other people. And we need a nice dinner for them. Eight months pregnant. Now, I'm sure she didn't cook the meal by herself. I'm sure she had lots of help. But you can imagine the stress of having the president, not only for dinner with 30 more people, but also all those people spending the night in your place. How many of you have been to the Will's house and seen the bedroom? Let me see. It's okay. If you haven't, there it is. You don't have to bother going to the future. Uh, it's a nice bedroom. It's a very nice bedroom. Uh, very spacious. And those two windows look out on the square. One of the questions, lots of questions, is was Lincoln protected while he was here? And the answer is yes. Uh, Sergeant Hugh Paxton Bingham with the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry. He's local. He will be stationed outside of Lincoln's door. When a telegram comes that evening, the telegram will be given to him from White, the, the executive mansion. And he will then hand it to the president, knocks on the door and hands it to him. And the, the telegram essentially said, Tad's doing better. He's feeling better. And to his credit, it tells you what kind of guy uh, the president is. He comes out and he tells this, I don't say a lowly sergeant, a, uh, a soldier, he tells him that how relieved he is that his son is feeling much better. Part of the president wouldn't even bother, you know, a lowly guy comes out and he talks to him. His brother, Rush uh, Bingham, is going to be stationed at the front door. So you do have guards, and there will be other members of the 21st Pennsylvania wandering around the town as well. So you do have um, potential guards all through the town. Now, you've been on that train for several hours. What do you want to do when you get to the Will's house? You want to freshen up, right? Yeah. And then what do you want to do? It's about 6, 6.30. You want dinner. And all you want to do is decompress, relax. It's not been an easy trip. And all of a sudden, you hear all this music playing because different bands... The fifth or a fifth New, New York artillery band, uh, a quartet will sing. And he doesn't mind that. What he minds are people pounding on the windows, demanding that he come out and give a speech, give a talk. He was less happy about that. So what do you do? They're demanding that they see the president. Well, we have, according to a newspaper, reporters who were there writing down what he spoke, <laughs> there is what he said. Lincoln was, there was no better president who could write a speech than Lincoln. In fact, there were very few speech writers who could ever get anywhere close to Lincoln. And the Gettysburg Address may have been the, the most, the best speech ever written. Doesn't say a whole lot. Essentially says, I don't have a whole lot for you to, to say to you. Come tomorrow. They're not happy. And they go next door where William Seward is, and they're gonna they're gonna demand that William Seward come out. And they're gonna go next to Edward McPherson, who's congressman, to his house. They're gonna go to Usher, where he is, Secretary Usher. They want speeches. Remember, there's no televisions, no radios. This is how they get their enjoyment, hearing these boring speeches. This is the reaction to his remarks. I love the first one. He said nothing, but he said it very well. <laughs> um, one thing that, that really, one of the things that Linda and I were confronted with when we wrote this book is there are literally hundreds of first-person accounts of men and women who said they were there, but they wrote the recollections of their memoirs 20, 40, 60 years later, as though it was yesterday. Now, if you get into uh, memory and memory science, you know that the memory, our memories are very frail. It's very, they're very malleable. And something that happened, maybe even yesterday, you know, this happens with Linda and me. Sometimes we'll have a distinctly different impression of what happened last week. 
But imagine 60 years ago where you've been reading all of these accounts of Lincoln and you're integrating them into your own perspectives that you were there. And if you believe it, there must have been hundreds of people sitting on the stage or sitting right in front of Lincoln, hundreds of people um, that he patted on the head as he shook hands with. And when we wrote this book, and we can be criticized for this, we eliminated all of them. We only looked at first person accounts, newspaper articles, um, uh, diaries, letters, etc., that were written soon after. But here, why am I saying all of this? Well, look at this last one. This is John Hay, one of his two personal secretaries. This is his diary. Okay, maybe he didn't do it that night. Maybe he did it a couple days later. But look what he writes. He said a few dozen words. We saw it wasn't a few dozen words. It was many words, meaning nothing. That's interesting. And then he went in. So I think he got the, uh, the last part right. Okay. Another mystery. Where did he write this speech? Now, how many of you, as a child, in school had to read a short story called The Perfect Tribute? Anybody? Okay, I guess you're not old enough to remember that. This would have been in the 20s and 30s. Every school child had to read this book. In fact, here she is, right there. Nice lady. Made a lot of money on this book. Mary um, Shipman Andrews. It was a novel. It wasn't real. She made, she had heard stories. She never purported this to be true. But do you remember what she said, what was written here? It became part of the vernacular. That Lincoln is sitting there all by himself on the train. Can you imagine Lincoln sitting all by himself on the train? And he sees us, an envelope lying on the ground on John uh, Garrett's car. Can you imagine that it being dirty, that there's litter on it? I can't imagine. He picks up the envelope. He takes off his top hat, puts it on his lap. He's going to use it as a writing desk. Pulls out a pencil and writes the Gettysburg Address on the back of that envelope. You've heard that story, right? Wrong. We know that's not what happened. We know that the first page of that speech was written at the executive mansion. It said it's stationary. It says executive mansion at the top. There's no question about that. And he wrote it when he thought, yeah, there's a good chance I'm coming. I'm going to put my thoughts on it in writing. And some will tell you that he's been thinking about these remarks for months and months. They've been formulating into his head, and now he's putting more paper. The second page is very different. And what's going to happen is that there will be an aide to President Lincoln, I'll explain who he is, who'll come down that evening after dinner and he asks David Wills, do you have a piece of paper and a pencil for the president? And he gives it to him and he leaves. And According to David Wills, when Lincoln is giving his seminal address, that's that piece of paper on the second page. He thought it was the same page, the same type of paper that he gave to Lincoln the night before. It is fairly clear that Lincoln did finish his Gettysburg address at the Wills house that evening. And I don't blame him. Think about it. If you're not certain you're coming, are you going to spend all that energy fine-tuning a speech? No. And maybe he also wasn't quite certain what he wanted to, how he wanted to finish it. Maybe he wanted more of the atmosphere of Gettysburg to really give him inspiration. That's not him writing the speech, by the way. Okay. So how many times have you, whether you're in school, whether, um, Scott, I don't know if you ever do this, um, you have a very important report that you have to give, okay? You're in sixth, seventh grade, whatever. What do you do? You write it down and you practice it. And then do you see your parents? Do you want them to listen to you? Sure, I would. 
He's going to go next door to to have William Seward critique it. But it is so crowded that square is must have thousands of guys and gals in that square. He can't make it his way literally ten feet from the side door of the David Wills house to the entrance of um, <coughs> Harper, Robert Harper's house next door on the square. And he tells uh, Sergeant Bingham, you walk, I'm going to hold on to your coattails, and we're going to go like this <laughs> and get to the, uh, get next door. And he does. He's going to be there for a little while. Uh, Seward's going to critique it. We assume, we don't know for certain, wouldn't it have been nice if Lincoln had lived and he actually prepared his own memoirs? Wouldn't that, that have been nice? Uh, this is something else that happens. Um, <clears throat> he's still not certain what he wants to write. And so he's going to be asked to come up, this is David Wills, <laughs> and talk to the president because he, the president really wants to understand Tell me exactly what my role is. What is it that you think would be appropriate for me to say? So he's still cogitating about it. Oh, I love this part. The unexpected visit. So I want you to imagine you're Edward Everett. It's midnight. You're sleeping. I don't know how to sleep. Could, maybe my wife can sleep through anything. Um, but there is noise that you cannot imagine out on that square because nobody's sleeping. They're hooping and hollering and they're playing music, etc. And there's poor Edward Everett trying to sleep and there's a knock on the door. And he gets up and he answers the door and it's David Wills. And David Wills apologizes for disturbing him. He says, the governor has just arrived. The governor's train broke down, and now here he is. He says, the problem is, I have no place for the governor to sleep. Can he sleep in your bed? Now, we always think it's unseemly today. You know, it's okay for two women to sleep in the same bed, but two men, no. I don't know why, but it's not, you know, we giggle about that. It was perfectly fine back then for two men to spend the night in the same bed. Can Governor Curtin spend the night with you, Edward Everett? And he says, absolutely not. Hmm. And I don't know if he pushed him out the door and slammed the door, but he made it very clear the governor was not going to sleep with him. And oftentimes you wonder why. Why would he do that? Because it was typical. Governor didn't have a place to sleep. Well, look over here. Um, so this is showing you uh, during the, the dedication ceremony, probably right before it began, here's the Evergreen Gatehouse just to get a perspective. Here is, um, here is the, the, you can see the speaker's platform. And right there is a tent. Have you ever noticed that tent before? You know why that tent's there? Because Edward, Edward Everett insisted on it. It's probably a comfort tent. So imagine Edward Everett has urinary issues. And they didn't have to pens for men back then. So he could be very close to a uh, comfort tent where he could run out, do his business, get back on stage. Imagine you have the governor lying there next to you mm. and you wake up and you're, you wet the bed because you can't control your urine. And not only are you soaked, but the governor of Pennsylvania is also soaked. I, he can't stay with me. No, he can't. Okay. Now, this is kind of controversial. I was listening to a podcast with Tim Smith. I am familiar with accounts of this. He said it did not happen. I'm going to stick by saying it did happen. That the president is going to get up early in the morning, the morning of the dedication, on the 18th, on the 19th, and he's going to get into what they call, made a very big deal of it, a springless buckboard with, with Secretary of State Seward. And they're going to go out to the battlefield. Not for very long, maybe an hour. We don't know where he went. It's one of the mysteries. Well, if you imagine, he may have gone out Chambersburg Street and go out on Chambersburg Pike 
And what's right there, as you get toward what's currently Stone Avenue, that area? Yeah, that's where General Reynolds was killed. Remember? He had a personal relationship with General Reynolds. Remember, he offered General Reynolds the command of the Army of the Potomac. Reynolds turned him down. I think that he went to visit that area, saw it, was inspired, came back. We don't know. He's going to dress for the event. And this is the, um, the program, which is amazing in its detail. And I don't know if I mentioned this before, but imagine you came from York, Pennsylvania, okay? Maybe you came the morning of, you didn't want to spend the night in Gettysburg. And the president and the secretary of, um, of states there and, and lots and lots of congressmen and, and lots of elected officials and the military, they're going to put on a parade. Where are you going to be? Are you going to be lining Baltimore Street and watching the, the, the procession go by? I would. Mm -mm, that's not what you're doing. You're going to be part of the procession. You're going to bring up the rear. So the military is going to organize themselves on Carlisle Street. On York Street will be the influential people, you know, like the president, elected officials. The Knights Templar, the, uh, the Masonic Lodges, actually listen. It shows you, if you have a chance to look at this, how uh, everything is specific. And then finally toward here, fire companies bring up the, the, are also lit. And then they start talking about the states. What state is going to be first by name? Pennsylvania. So we're going to be next after the fire guys. Yes. And then other states, and then um, District of Columbia, and then the territory. I mean, boom, 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 boom. And we're marching. Uh, okay, let's pick this up. There's a procession. Have you seen this? I'm sure you've seen this before. But this is, um, the, 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 the camera would be around Steinmer Avenue. They're looking toward the square. This is the Farnsworth House right here. This is Mr. G's ice cream, the Weinbrenner House. This is the old rough house uh, that was torn down and repositioned. And look at that. You see that? Looks like sticks. Those are bayonets. Uh, so the soldiers are leading the procession toward the, uh, toward the cemetery. You've got marshals. We're not going to talk about them. Another controversy. Lake, no one could be in a wagon. No one could be uh, in a carriage. You either walked or you rode on a horseback. That was it. So they're going to give a horse to Lincoln. Lincoln's going to ride on a horse. Some say that it is the smallest horse they have ever seen. They've never seen such a tiny horse. They say that it was so tiny that the president's legs were almost touching the ground. He looked ridiculous, they said. Why did they give him such a small horse? Because he couldn't ride. And he fell off and he probably would fall off. He's not going to hurt himself if he's up high. Well, who do you think said this? The Democrats. The Democrats that are trying to make the president look ridiculous and silly. I mean, times were the worse now, but they were pretty bad back then. The Republicans, what kind of horse? Whoa. The biggest, blackest steed they ever saw. Probably somewhere in between. But you and uh, you know, you have that. We don't know. We've never seen a photograph of Lincoln on the horseback. And here is simply showing what happens. The percent, the uh, the uh, list of activities while the ceremony is going on. Very interesting. Okay, I think I showed you this before. Um, by the way, some very interesting photographs. See that guy right there? That's Governor Curtin? Yeah. And we know it's Governor Curtin because one, he looks like Governor Curtin, but two, we, we know that he came with his son. There he is. And he has some really great photographs. Uh, they're blown up. Let's see it over there. You can see it over here. You see the guy over there. 
It's going to get closer. And there he is, the big guy. Does he look happy? I think he's very pensive. He's very depressed. Uh, he's been taken in by all of the air of, of sadness that permeates Gettysburg. And this is it. One of the controversies is where is that speaker's platform? And I, if I had more time, I go through all of the permutations, but let me just say this. It was not known, there was controversy until, I guess it was last year, year before last, a faculty member, Christopher Oakley, from a university in Southern Florida who worked at Disney and used Disney techniques of triangulation and other approaches, finds that the um, the speaker's platform actually was between the two cemeteries. Initially, before this, everyone believed, you know where Jenny Wade, where her um, grave is in the Evergreen Cemetery? That's where they thought it was, the speaker's platform. He says, nope, not there. Gives us some type of triangulation, and there it is. It actually straddles the two cemeteries with the actual front where Lincoln is going to be speaking, Edward Everett, etc., is in the National Cemetery, and the rest of it, including the comfort tent, will be in the Evergreen Cemetery. And people are now saying, yep, yeah, mystery solved. Because his technique was was impeccable. Yes. And there is Christopher Oakley right there. Anybody know who this guy is? Leon Reed, who is a newspaper guy, he's also an author. And if you walk around, you know, where the uh where the fence is between the two cemeteries, and if you see the rhododendrons, that's where approximately where that speaker's platform was located. Okay, so let me ask you a question. You are there, 1863, November 19th, two hours. Are you gonna be listening two hours, rapt attention? What would you be doing? I wouldn't. I'd be probably taking a little nap, and then we'd probably would make a little lunch, maybe talk to my buddies. I think a lot of people by the end of his talk, had completely zoned out. And here comes the president, and many, many people never heard the president speak because it was such a short presentation. Did Lincoln read his remarks? A question mark. There are people who were there leaving first-person accounts who said absolutely not. He memorized every word. Now, wait a minute. When did he finish his comments? The second page. The night before. Could you finish a, a report the night? You've seen the second. I mean, you know how long this is. Imagine the, uh, the Gettysburg Address, half of it. You wrote the night before. Could you have memorized it? Well, some would say that Lincoln had a new photographic memory. And could have. Some said he read every single word. Some said he looked up, he looked down. We don't know because you have all this conflicting information. People remember it differently. Some said he rocked back and forth, never looked up. Others said he looked up and looked down. We don't know. It's frustrating, but it's kind of a mystery, and hopefully we'll find something definitive to tell us what happened. Now, these are simply representations of Lincoln, um, just to go through them. And you can see how different artists will be uh, representing him. You know, you can see very dramatic. I don't think he was doing anything dramatic. I think Stanton. he was, I'm sorry? I think that one has Stanton in it, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm, I, I hate to say this, but I don't think there were many women on the stage either. Oops. All right. You probably saw that, right? You weren't supposed to see that. <laughs> Another mystery is 
did Lincoln ad lib at all? Well, we there were newspaper reporters on that stage taking every word down. And we can compare what he has in his notes, it's the Nicolay copy, it's in the Library of Congress, with what was printed in the Ohio newspapers and other newspapers around the country. And we know he had lived. He added two words under God. Now, is Lincoln Catholic, Presbyterian, Jewish? No. He doesn't believe in organized religion. He'll go to a Presbyterian church with Mary Todd, but he's not a member of it. But he does believe in God. He's very spiritual. He will profess um, that he's a follower of Jesus Christ. And even though he didn't put it in his remarks, his written remarks, apparently he was so taken up by the, how solemn the occasion was that he ad-libs those two words. And what's interesting is he will write four other versions of it. And the first couple, he doesn't include those two words. The later ones, he starts putting them in, which is kind of interesting. Ah. Uh, Another question, another mystery. Did the audience applaud? Hmm. Now think about it. Here's the president that you probably never heard in person giving a, his remarks. Would you applaud? Yeah, right? That sounds reasonable. Wait a minute. Is it like a funeral? Is it like a solemn occasion? Have you ever seen anyone applaud at a, at, a, at a funeral? No. Well, these same people, newspaper people, will record applause, 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 and long continued applause at the end of the speech. Now, I believe that. I mean, why, why would they have an axe to grind? They were explicit. They, they identified. They were able to write his words explicitly. And I do believe they did. People did applaud. How were those remarks received? Well, it depends. Look at the, look at the one on the left. What gets the biggest play after the Gettysburg Cemetery? What's the biggest words, the biggest, what's highlighted most? Edward Everett's address, right? And where do you see the president? Right here. Small letters, everything else is caps, in big font, speeches by not just the president, Secretary of State, and others. Guess which newspaper this was? It's a Democratic newspaper. Republican newspapers were very, 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 very effusive in their praise. Look at this one. This is a this is all that is reported about his speech in our Harrisburg Patriot News back in 1863. This is what they reported. Let's read it together. We passed over the silly remarks of the president. For the credit of the nation, we are willing that a veil of oblivion shall be dropped over them. They're horrible remarks, they're saying. And that they shall be no more repeated uh, or thought of. Thank you. That's horrible. It's a democratic newspaper. And what I really appreciate is during the 160th anniversary, guess what? They printed a retraction. <laughs> it wasn't so bad after all. It's pretty good. Okay. Ah, was Lincoln Hill. His son has a form of smallpox, very communicable. He did catch it. There is no question about it. And one of the initial symptoms is extreme fatigue. You're just tired, you just don't feel good. He was, Lincoln admitted this while he was in Gettysburg. This is what happens if you get a full blown of the real. Smallpox. I mean, it's pretty bad, and it's probably going to kill you. What most people don't realize, and what the White House staff and the cabinet tried to keep from everyone in the nation, 
was that Lincoln is going to take to his bed for at least three weeks after. He is very, very ill. They did not want the nation to get all upset and worry about what's going to happen if he dies. So they're going to keep it very, very quiet. Ah, he's going to be cared for by Linda, by William Johnson. Anyone familiar with William Johnson? William Johnson's an interesting guy. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. We don't have time. But William Johnson is a barber from Illinois. And when Lincoln is riding the circuit, he will frequently stop at William Johnson's barbershop. And then the two men had very similar personalities. They loved to talk. They loved to crack jokes. They had a good time with each other. When Lincoln becomes president, he says to William Johnson, hey, how about if I give you a job in the White House? What do you think? And he says, yeah, I'll come over. And there's more to tell, but I'm not going to tell the rest of that story. But he is going to be the one who accompanies Lincoln to Gettysburg, a black man. And he will be the one who will go down and get the paper from um, David Wills and bring David Wills up. He's, a, he's probably sleeping in the same bed with Lincoln, and that's fine. And when Lincoln returns to the White House, who's going to take care of him? William Johnson. And what is William Johnson's, uh, what is the return favor? He will get a full blown case of smallpox and will die in January of 1864. And Lincoln, as you can imagine, is grief stricken because he knows he gave it to him. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it. this other than feeling horrible. And he's going to make sure that he's going to be buried in the um, Arlington National Cemetery. Okay. Uh. Nobody's left? Well, I lost one, but thank you for staying. Okay, I don't know how many on Zoom or have gone to bed. Almost done, though, I promise. All right, what do you do? You are, your wife's mad at you. You know that your son is feeling better, but he's still not out of the woods completely. What do you do? I know what I do. I'm getting back on that train, and I'm going home, right? Maybe Mary won't be so mad at me. Well, he doesn't do that. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. What do you want to do after a long day? You have lunch, right? At the Will's house. And this is a man who loves to press the flesh. And so there's a long line of people lined up on York Street. And who's standing outside of, of um, David Will's front door? I said, Lincoln, he's going to shake your hand. He's going to breathe in your face. He's going to kiss your babies. You walk through the Wills house, through his um, uh, his uh, law office, and who is standing right as you leave by the side entrance? Who's standing right there? Governor Kirk. You get to shake his hand. It's pretty good. So the question becomes, oops, how many people do you think he may have infected no, with very old? We don't know. I'm sure he, he probably infected some. Okay. At that point, I'm leaving. Okay. Nope. He's going to the Presbyterian Church. Why would you go to, if, if he's not Presbyterian, if he doesn't really believe in organized religion, why is he going there? Anyone? Well, the state of Ohio, Ohio, is a big Republican state. The governor is present at the dedication ceremonies. Lieutenant governor, governor-elect, congressman. And they rent the Presbyterian Church right on Baltimore Street, not for a church service, but a political rally. And they say to Lincoln, we'd like you to attend. What do you do? He says, hmm, who helped me get elected in 1860? Ohio? Who do I need next year to get reelected? Ohio? Where am I, am I going home? Mm -mm. I'm going to that church. And he's not going to go alone. He's going to go with the hero of Gettysburg, John Burns. All four foot ten or eleven of them. 
And Lincoln, who's six four, you can imagine, looks like Mutt and Jeff walking down the street. And they will attest it side by side during this political rally. One of them falls asleep, mm. as you can imagine. Now, who do you think? Everybody says, well, it has to be this guy. Oops. This guy. He's 69 years old. He's old. And if we don't have a nap, we're probably going to fall asleep. I took a nap, so I'm not falling asleep tonight, right now. They all think it must be um, John Burns. But remember, Lincoln probably didn't sleep that night, the night before. He's starting to feel the effects of variola. He, I think he was the one who fell asleep. And at the 7 o'clock in the evening, there's going to be a tap on his shoulder, whether he's awake or not. Mr. President, your train is leaving. He's going to go back to the Wills House, thank them for their hospitality. He gets back on the train. And that, so you've all seen this church, but that's not the original church. That's not the church he went to. That church has been knocked down in the early 1900s. It's been replaced with this church on the same foundation. They do have the pew. Have you all been to that Presbyterian church? Okay, they do have that pew, um, and they tried to put it in the approximate spot it would have been, but it's not exactly the same. Okay, one more thing. How did Lincoln feel about the speech? You think he was happy with it? Well, here's what we have. Ward Lehman is one of his best friends. He's going to be there at the ceremony, actually helps to um, create the cemetery, plan it. Lincoln will say to him in all seriousness, that speech fell on the audience like a wet blanket. I am distressed about it. I ought to have prepared it with more care. Probably he saw people who didn't know what was going on, milling around, not paying attention. He probably thought he lost the audience. Wayne McVeigh is a, also a, a good friend of his. And Wayne will say, you've made an outstanding, immortal address, Mr. President. And Lincoln responds, oh, you must not say that. You must not be so extravagant about it. And McVeigh can only shrug his shoulders and say, it, 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 it's inexplicable. But he actually believed that he did not give an appropriate speech. He did not think it was very good. So the aftermath, well, obviously the war is going to continue. Lincoln will take to his bed. Edward Everett will catch pneumonia in 1865, I believe in January. He'll succumb. He'll die a couple months before the president. And we talked about Edward Johnson died. So lots of mysteries. I wish I could say definitive, definitive, definitive. That's what makes history fun, that we don't know exactly what happened and there's all these possibilities. So I want to thank you for your attentiveness. Nobody fell asleep. Thank you. Any questions you might have? Yes. You mentioned that some of the thoughts were milling around his mind for a while. Some people say that his address to the crowd on the 7th of July after after Battle of Gettysburg and the surrender at uh, Vicksburg was very... It had similar components. Yeah. Um, there's no question that he was thinking about the speech. He wanted to give the speech. This was an appropriate time to give the speech. But you think about it. You know, how many of us would have left our sick child, our angry wife, and would have come all the way, slept all the way to Gettysburg? He did it for a variety of reasons. You know, one was these men had given their last full measure. The least that he could do was to acknowledge that sacrifice. And also people are starting to say, why are we doing this? Why are we continuing to, to fight this war? The, 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 the losses have been too great, the horrors too, too immense. Let's let the South go. And Lincoln has to beat the drum. We've got to continue this, this fight. It is so important. Any other questions? Yes. There's a book that was written a while back ago. I think it was called The Writings of Reagan. And they collected all of his chicken scratch and he wrote a lot of his jokes. And after his passing, they found a container with a ton of jokes. And there's some very good ones on there, like if you look on YouTube. <clears throat> when it came to his writing style, was he constantly kind of writing a diary 
capturing thoughts and 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 when he was preparing remarks, or was he such an orator that he a lot of times just did it on the fly? I was just curious what you what you learned as you. So you talking about Lincoln? Yeah. My my sense is he didn't write a lot of things down. They were ruminating in his head, and when it was appropriate for him to talk or to give a speech, that's when they would come out. I, there's no indication that he kept a diary or anything of that nature. And, you know, if we had chicken scratchings, um, he, there were lots of communications, but it, was, but it was more to someone else, a communication, whether it was McClellan or politician, but not him talking, you know, writing down things that he wants to remember for, for a future speech. That's a great question. Thank you. And, and sounds interesting. I'll have to look at that, that up about Reagan. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very good book. And I just I picked it up at a yard sale, I think. But I, I was fascinated by his pattern of life. He'd be inspired by something and would write it down. And I just was curious. You yeah. know, Lincoln had a similar writing style or different experiences, different thoughts, different ideas. Maybe just put them on a shelf. And then, and then as different events transpired, we would go back to that. That's all. I'm just kind of curious. About yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that um, Linda and I sometimes talk about is the state of Reagan's state of mind. And some would say that he had dementia while he was still in the latter part of his presidency. And maybe he's compensating by writing more things down than he would have when he was younger. I, I don't know, but it's fascinating. It's a fascinating question. Thank you for that. Well, I'll be around. Oh, yes. Sorry, one more uh, online. Oh, yes. Uh, good question. When did we begin to commemorate the anniversary at the cemetery of the Gettysburg? When, that's a great question. Um, formally, I don't know. Scott, do you know? Actually, no. I know that informally, they would do it every year after the war, especially after that, that memorial went off. But uh, nothing to the big deal it is today. He also asked if there was ever a recreation of the parade in the Will's house. Um, oh, the procession. Yeah, procession. That's another great question, you know, because they recreate everything. Mm -hmm. um, my sense would be not, because I think it would be difficult to get soldiers with bayonets and, you know, all of these people riding with horses. I, I I would say no, that instead of it they have the um, the regular parade, you know, in in conjunction with Remembrance Day. Good questions though. Well, oh yes, please. On the um, was that was a book published on the uh, triangulation? The one I just mentioned. Yeah, so the... no, actually, uh, for instance, uh, there was an issue of um, Smithsonian. The Smithsonian Magazine uh, a couple of years ago. I don't know if anybody's seen it. And these illustrations, I'm not, I, it wasn't the Smithsonian, it was also in the New York Times. And these illustrations, in fact, are, not supposed to be <laughs> are from the New York Times. Is that in your book? <laughs> no, <laughs> it came out after the book, and I would not have put it in if I wasn't supposed to. You got to be real careful. Because, you know, I like my bank account and, you know, some of these attorneys, they want blood and money. So you got to be really careful, right, Scott? Okay. Oh, yes. Is the building that's at Hanover Junction that was in the photo, the building that's there now, a recreation, or is that still the same? Building? Ah, the expert right there. Uh, yeah, the building in Hanover Junction is the original building heavily rebuilt. Uh, it was rebuilt between 1998 and 2001. It was rededicated in the fall of 2001, and that was my very first Civil War event as a New York County. Having moved here from Cleveland, Ohio, I attended the dedication and got hooked on York County Civil War history. Yeah, it's the same building, but there's not a lot of it that's original. As a new Pennsylvanian, I ride by the rail trail on my bike. That has that built for all the time. It's Lincoln's statue. Yeah. Yeah. Part, parts of the building are original, but most of this. Well, most recreated. have been recreated. Thank you. Great. These are all great questions. Thank you.
Well, Linda and I will be around for a little bit if you have any other questions, but thank you so much for being so attentive.